Hello and welcome to Show Love. I'm Bronwyn Murphy. Now I know I tend to gush over people but sometimes their energy is so warm and kind that I just want to tell them so. And I tell her she's amazing about a million times. It was bloody lovely to reconnect with my old friend Helen Blakeman who is now a BAFTA and Emmy award winning writer from Liverpool who always sees the magic in people loving nothing more than a chatter as she says everyone has a story. Today, I am joined by British playwright and screenwriter, Helen Blakeman. Hello, Helen. Hi, Bronners. <laughs> Bronners, I love her. <laughs> oh, that's so lush. Anyone who really knows me calls me Bronners. <laughs> People at school call me Bod. I don't know if that was my nickname at school. I'm really excited to talk to you uh, for two massive reasons. One, because you have such an amazing career writing about things people don't always talk about which is what show love is all about and two because we studied together at university she did. in liverpool yeah. um and you've always been such a kind and lovely person that oh. i need to see more we're gonna do this totally. again we're gonna do we this totally again uh, so firstly i met you in 93 which is oh, fucking sh- years ago <laughs> Don't do the math. No, don't do the math. Um, I was very excited because I, I, it was the first time I'd ever been in Liverpool. Uh, home of the Beatles, which you yeah. probably get sick of people saying. But but anyone who doesn't know Liverpool and then goes there, it's like, oh my God, because the Beatles are amazing. Yeah. Um, you grew up there. Yes. What was it like growing up in Liverpool in the 70s and 80s? Oh my God. I mean, it was quite, it was quite tough. And I, I don't mean tough as in harsh or anything. I mean, financially, you know, I'm, I'm from a single parent family and it was financially tough. Um, but Liverpool's always had a heart to it, and so it was always interesting. Um, and, and when you're growing up, you don't... It's just your life, isn't it? You don't know any, anything different. So yeah, I suppose, yeah. It's, it's just kind of but fine. But to somebody I mean, who grew up down south, growing up in Liverpool, like you say, it has a heart. There's also something quite cool about it. Yeah, it is, and everybody talks to each other, so you kind of brought up just chat chatting to people you know I just don't have any issues with being talking. friendly yeah, loving just talking like you are. to anyone on our way here today we were we, we've stopped already and helped a lady get in her house <laughs> broken she had, shoulder she had a broken shoulder and we carried a bag and um and that, oh, was but just, that, that doesn't happen to me I bet that happens to you all the time all the time yeah see it's you and your northern roots honestly I make train friends I'm always up and down to London Do you? notorious for making train friends and my kids came home from school one day and went, oh, my God, Mum, you and your train friends, we've got this supply PE teacher. And they were like, she was like, oh, Helen's your mum, is you? Met her on a train. <laughs> and they're like, oh, Mum. See, I've never even heard of train it. friends. I just made it up because I just oh, gathered you have so many. <laughs> That's amazing. Honestly, even a five-year-old boy. Oh, you are so lovely. He just, he just sat in front of me on the table with cross legs and talked at me till, in the end, we just chatted the whole way. Is this maybe because you see the world differently as well because you are a writer? Are you sort of probably see, do, do you think this inspires you in ways? I suppose it does. I like finding that. I think most people are interested. Yeah. And, and all we'll, that we get usually is like the surface, don't we, of people. We don't really know what's underneath. Which is why I am doing this podcast. Exactly. I love that shit. And everybody's got a story or, you know, and you're like, no way. Or you find out that people have met somebody. And, and I've got a, a great train friend, one of my first ones. This was a great a great train journey, which was um, me. There was a woman opposite and a girl to the left. The girl to the left was a trained opera singer who was in Barnum at the Liverpool Empire and was travelling up, but she'd broken her arm. And the woman opposite me was so beautiful, and she was the lead violinist at the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra. And I was like, this is top, top train friend. Your top train friend. Right here. And so the girl, who was the opera singer, and I've met her, I've been for coffee and stuff and everything, and she's she's going to be a pretty woman, I think, in the West End soon. And And she said to me, tell me somewhere in Liverpool that I should go that you wouldn't find in a travel book or whatever. And I went, the Buddhist centre in Sefton Park. And right. she went, how do you know I'm a Buddhist? And I was like, I didn't. Oh, my God. But it's think, you then, it's you. Oh, it's probably me. Yeah. Loads of, honestly, it, it, if you want weird shit to happen, <laughs> <laughs> spend a bit of time with me. Well, we have just had the weirdest shit happen because we are currently in a director friend of mine's uh, house, Tim, uh, uh, who, uh, I mean, Tim Van Temeren, uh, who might be listening to this later on, who has the most 
fucking awesome house I think I've ever seen. It's so beautiful, and we've got this incredible view over um, half of London. Yeah, right I, like now. you could see the Shard, you can see Canary Wharf. He pointed out Tottenham. I mean, it's beautiful as well. And I feel as though it's like magic, isn't it? <laughs> so it's like, it's like magic. Honestly, I want to hang out with you more. But honestly, if I always and this sound, this does sound a little bit wanky, but. If you, I find that if I'm kind of happy slash in the zone of feeling happy and open and kind of all okay, quite good stuff happens. Yeah, I'm kind of with you on that, yeah. And so I'll get an email unexpectedly that's yeah. really good or, you know, you'll yeah. bump into somebody that you haven't seen for ages or like we like, found our way into this house and we're like, what? Yeah, it's <laughs> even got it's even got one of those blue things on the front that has a like... blue plaque. Uh, yeah, blue plaque, which is amazing. I'll, I'll uh, put it on the website. Lovely, lovely uh, little blue plaque. Um, it's like Roald Dahl says, if you want to see the magic, you'll see the magic. I think Absolutely. he said something like that. Yeah. yeah. And even if he didn't, he yeah, did Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> It's definitely a quote out there. It's something like that. But I, That's why I'm a little bit in love with David Williams. He's like the new Roald Dahl. I was at National Youth Theatre with him. Oh, were you? Yeah. He what? was called Dave Williams then. Was he? Yeah. Was he nice? Yeah, I can't remember him that much. He was on a different course to me. Him and Matt Lucas were on a different course. But my friend Louise is still like busy mates with him. You really do know him. <laughs> I'll always know, you know that Six Degrees of Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kevin, Kevin Bacon or whatever. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, anyway, while we're talking about, we yeah, so I, I did ask you about Liverpool, and I've kind of like, gone away from it. We'll talk yeah. about Liverpool again in a minute. Yeah, yeah. But like you say, growing up in Liverpool, there was a certain amount of it being cool, and just yeah, but you you just kind of don't really realise that it's cool. It was poor at the time. There's yeah. been a lot of since it was capital of culture. There's been a lot of investment in the city, and the city's changed. But again, that poor that you said you experienced. Yeah, I think that enhanced your writing because oh, absolutely, you've you've written some bloody great and, things from that yeah totally and, and also when I started out being a writer you know I wanted to write stories that were from the voices who, of people whose voices aren't usually heard yeah. and that's what's always driven and always everything that I've written really there's always a female at the heart of it and there will always be that at the heart of it it's even um you know, stuff that I've done, children's TV stuff, you know, it might be adapted from a book, but there will always be that little nugget at the heart of it. Yeah. There will always be a woman on a journey or, you know, a female on a journey. Is that anything to do with you at the heart of it? Oh, it must be, must yeah. be. Yeah. I remember um, the first agent that I had, I remember her saying, real writers only ever write their own myth. They just don't realise that oh, really? they're doing it. Yeah. And, you, and you try and write something else, but then somehow you just get looped back into the Ooh. same... Thing. And it might look different and it might appear different to the audience, but actually at the heart of it, there were there is always something sort of thematic. I don't know whether it's a, a cathartic thing. I d- I, yeah, well, I you just know. you're saying what you feel, right? Yeah. And you can only say it from your heart. Yeah, exactly. And everybody's had a different life experience. So, yeah. you know, if you were to write something, it'd be entirely different from what I write because you're you and I'm me. And yeah. you have to kind of... It's pretty well. You, you've done that well that you have your own wiki Cheers, babe. <laughs> Cheers, babe. <laughs> um, that was a really. I can't. Can't. I won't try and live a accent. You've got your own Wikipedia page. Uh-huh. You bloody made it, Helen Blakeman. <laughs> Because <laughs> anyone who's got a Wikipedia page has done bloody well, um, and it's got great stats. Like, because yeah. uh, I've looked at it, it, it says uh, you became involved in female Morris dancing, yeah. age three, yeah, to My sixteen, mom, yeah. Which you, so so for talking about yourself, you don't know you don't know what female Morris dancing is, but it's nothing to do with the bells and sticks. And oh, is it not? We all know what Morris no. dancing is, but no, it is a cross between Irish dancing, right. And cheerleading, oh. and sort of like majorette. So yeah, so it's like pom poms, like cheerleading, and um, it's all done in formation. You're sort of on your toes, dancing a little bit like Irish dancing. And it was always around. Um, it's like carnival dancing. So back at the time of like World War One, when all the men left the mill towns in Lancashire and the like, there was it would have been male Morris dancing then and clog dancing. And so the women took over, and then they just invented right. their own style, and right. that's what it's from. It's, it's still from, going, right? 
Oh, yeah, I wrote a play about yeah, it. Yeah, well, that's what I was going to say. You wrote yeah. The Morris yeah. in 2005, and yeah. it's about the rivalry between women. So did did you find that when you were growing up? It was about, it, it's a rivalry between troops, yeah. but it's, it's about the camaraderie of the women in the troop and also how the younger generation there was. I mean, for a lot of the time, you know, I probably didn't want to do Morris dancing, but it was my mum's social life. Yeah, yeah. So I kind of, I just went along because she did and sort of kind of kept on doing it until I was doing my GCSEs and then stopped. Um, or, or when you met boys. That's when you kind of stopped. Because that's when you kind of stopped yeah, doing anything is. that you do when you're yeah. a kid, isn't it? No, it was when I, I stopped <clears> and um, oh, I'm going to jump a question if I say this, but I got a job in Brookside and I couldn't do me Morris dancing. Ah, uh, see? No, well, yeah. th- that's good that you brought Brookside up because yeah. when, uh, it's funny because we, we've uh, got mutual friends that mm. we went to university with and I was like, because you said that you remembered me the first day. Yeah, you were the first person from uni that I met and we were at registration and that was just like a free for all. You didn't really meet people on your course, but I remember you were sat in front of me and you got up. And you gave your name and you said that you're doing drama. And I was like, oh, she's on my course and she's really pretty and she looks really cool. And so you were the first person that I ever met. That's hilarious that you remember that. But I remembered and I was I was texting uh, some of the other girls. They go, mm. now, all I can remember at uni about Helen, the first thing was, she, I'm sure she'd been in Brookside. And we were all like, because to me, I was some dumbass from Lambourne. I'd never done anything other than a school play. And you came in and it was like, oh, yeah, we're doing a, a, a drama degree at Liverpool U- University or whatever. Um, drama was. Mm. And, um, and you'd been in bloody Brookside. That was, like, proper. It was proper. And I... Um, so I was a little bit intimidated by you for that fact. I know, it's weird, doesn't it? Isn't it's it? Like, what you see and what you feel yeah. about people. And so for me, Brookside back, you know, then, it was like... But I was probably slightly embarrassed by it because it was 15... To sort of I seventeen, because I was like, "That's really cool." You're like, "No, nah, no, nah, you just played it under." Yeah, like, yeah. And but I would have been genuinely playing it, <laughs> da- you know, putting it down in a way because I'm like, "Oh yeah, mm, yeah." It was just a small but part. It's a big old, a big old show that I know. And and I, do you, do you want me to say yes. how I got Tell into it? Everything about so, Brookside. So, but at the time, my sister was training to be an actress, and she was at RADA. And like my mum, we've never had any kind of art background. My mum was a home help and worked in a was a cleaner in an old people's home and stuff like that. Anyway, my sister decided she wanted to be an actress. My mum was like, oh, my God, how? Anyway, she gets into RADA, and I start going to this, like... I love that, like, oh, she gets into RADA, like, that was... That's hard. I know. RADA was, like, the one. I know. (laughs) And then, and I'm thinking, "Mm, do you know what? I was doing, like, drama on Saturday afternoon with this group in a little hall in Allerton Road near Penny Lane, Beatles reference. (laughs) And, um, And then... I thought, I wonder how you get on the telly. And honestly, the only thing that I knew that was for or about somebody like me was Brookside. And recently, Jodie Comer said the same thing. She's was like, amazing. Isn't she? Amazing. And she, and she said, you know, that was her inspiration because it was the only thing that she knew that was like her. Yeah. Um, you wouldn't even know she's from Liverpool. Like, she no. never speaks in her accent. Like, every, every part, well, it's all different. You, but, so different. She's incredible. incredible. And um, anyway, I wrote a letter to Brookside oh. and I got a call like the day after the letter arrived. Oh, the day the, the letter. That's amazing. I know. And I'd even written it. You, you, you're of this generation branch. Remember like you'd have like smelly pens that smelled <laughs> like strawberries yeah, and stuff yeah. like that. So I hand wrote a CV and a letter and I'd like underlined bits in red, which is probably a smelly strawberry pen. <laughs> and... Um, And they were like, yeah, come in for an audition. And my mum probably told the school I had a dental appointment. And I went to the audition and I went back to school. And the geography teacher went, you've been for an audition at Brookside, haven't you? And I nearly died. How did she know? It was a bloke. And he went, oh, it's my mate who's the casting assistant. (laughs) And he said, but he was really cool. And he's like, hope you get it, hope you get it. And then I I, I had a recall and then... And then you got it? Yeah. Well, back in uni, then we were like quite, you know, proud of you. We were like, wow, that's... Cool, cool as hell. What's she doing starting with us? I know. Well, it was meant to be. Yes, it was meant to be, wasn't it? Was it was just it? meant to be. But we had some good times. Oh, really we did. Good times. Some of the best years of my life. Oh, and just, I just remember the laughs. Yeah. Really good laughs. And it, hangovers. Laughs and hangovers yeah. and just, 
really loads of fun. <clears throat> so Joy, your older sister, has yeah. gone on to do Coronation she acts, Street, yeah. Emma Dale. She's yeah. like, that's quite a lot. Yeah, and What's now she does comedy as well. So she runs some comedy nights in London. And she also, because obviously acting's not a, a, a regular job, she's... Um, uh, the like chief fundraiser for a homeless charity across oh, like five good. London boroughs. So it's it's just really yeah. We could probably see her. We probably from can. here. <laughs> from view. Um, and uh, I read this thing that you said that when you were five, you had no no ambition to do anything mm. other. Than somebody asked you what you wanted to do, and you said, "Oh, I want to be a tea lady," which sounds yeah. like a great job. I, Exactly, but I think it was something on the telly, and I can't remember what it was, but it was maybe a kid show, and it was a woman in it who like pushed a trolley around and stood around nattering. And I thought, yeah, I could quite, I could fancy that. I could do that now. Yeah, I could. I have to do that now. I want to open a tea shop by the sea, so oh, you well, know, like, I'm go. going, I'm going transferring some ambition. <laughs> um, so yeah, but I had no concept. But I used to. Um, my mum used to get catalogues, you know, like mail order catalogues. And I used to, as soon as when they came, I'm like, oh, you know, when when the, when the spring and summer one was no longer needed and the autumn winter one would arrive. My mum was cut, like that, little I'd ones cut, and all yeah, those, yeah, great universal. Yeah, and then and I and I'd cut out pictures from these catalogues and I stuck them in a scrapbook. But I invented families and houses. And I'd make up stories in my head. You fell in love with writing. I did. And, and so you, you went from acting to writing. Yeah. Uh, what is your writing process? Um, apart from just doing it when you've got to do it. I mean, you don't cut out the little... No, <laughs> I don't. But you, you start off really with, um, you know, the, a, a single, you know, with an idea and you put that down as a paragraph and then you write a page on it and then you write... Two, and that sounds glib, I don't mean it like that, but, you you know, there is a process if you're writing for TV in, of development where you, you know, you're basically kind of padding out the idea until you go to a scene-by-scene scene document, which is basically your episode in prose, right. broken down into yeah. scenes, and then you write your script from there. Because so there might a, be some people listening that are thinking, oh, I might give that a go. Yeah. I mean, it, it's quite hard to get inspired, is it? Um... Or are you like every day going, oh my God, I'm going to write about that, I'm going to write about that? No, I'm not like that because the, the, the ideas have to stick and there's so many things, there are so many um, things that influence what eventually happens and a load of it is just, I, I don't want to say look because it's not that, it's opportunity and chance and all the rest of it, but it's also about what broadcasters are looking for mm. and that's really difficult. How so do that you know can, that then? You go and have meetings with production companies mm. and they've had meetings with broadcasters and they're like, oh, we don't need period drama because it's too expensive. We but want, we're looking for, we're looking for this, you know, right, X, Y, right. and Z. And then, of course... Well, no, you, you're a writer. Yeah. They'll get you in and go, yeah. we like your style, but yeah. we want you to... Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, so that's what... Well, that's why you've got a Wikipedia page. Mm-hmm. So, uh, mm-hmm. just going back to uni quickly, mm-hmm. and then we'll move yeah, on yeah. to your fabulous career. Uh, you fell in love with someone yeah. at uni that I that I knew. Quite a, cu- a couple of people fell in love at uni, which is lovely. Yeah. Uh, now you have two children with yes. him. Um, and then you went on to do a master's... Well, before the children. Yeah. A master's in playwriting at Birmingham yeah. under the British playwright... David Edgar, yeah, and and that was quite lucky because he'd only just sort of started there, hadn't he? He'd he'd been there for a few years, so on, on oh, but like the, the chance previous, that you've got that. well, I didn't think I'd get it. Um, I thought you had to be like Arthur Miller or somebody to do like a master's degree. You know, someone's like, going to say like, that. Oh, I want to be like Helen Blakeman. But I, I honestly, it's it's like it. You know, it, it does leave me scratching my head and going, me really. Oh. Um, but when I got there, most other people were doing it because they were like lectures at lectures at different colleges or were doing it for their job or whatever. And I was one of the only people who wanted to be a writer who yeah. was doing it for that reason. So before me, Sarah Kane, um, who's a famous writer and sadly no longer with us, um, she'd been on the course. And David Edgar is like the cleverest person I've ever met. And it felt academic to me, a lot of it, which scared the living daylights out of me because I just wanted to write... So while I was there, I put all of my effort into writing mm. my first play, which is called Caravan. And so that was in 98? Yeah, 97, 98, something like that. And that, and that uh, for anyone who hasn't seen it, which you should try and see it, and there is, uh, you're, you're putting it on again, aren't you? Tomorrow, so? we're doing yeah. a rehearsed reading at the Park Theatre in Finsbury Park. That's so lovely. Yeah, so it's just so nice to be talking about it yeah. today. 
And it's a, a black comedy about a mum and two daughters staying in a mm. caravan in North Wales. Yeah. Now, you grew up with a single mum yeah. and you have an older sister. Yeah. Is this, again, based on your... It's not really, no. I mean, it's the, the dynamic could be said that it is, but it's really not us. No. At all. And it's actually more about people that I knew oh. in Liverpool that were of that similar dynamic and more about, like, the tales that my mum told me and... Um, yeah, I, I got really interested in the, how people connect with relationships and then um, somebody else goes on to have a relationship with that same person, but they live on like the same council estate, which sounds as though I'm decrying that, but I'm not. But, you know, these things happen. Yeah, yeah. And so it was about like real well, life stories. Not non council estate. I mean, exactly. It yeah. all over the world. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, so that was on at the Bush Theatre in 97, I think. So and then, suddenly I was a writer. Yeah, I mean, like, so uh, the, you, somebody came to see that play. Yeah. And, and then took it to the Bush. Tell us through that. So, like I'd written a letter to Brookside going, how'd you get on the telly? Um, when we were doing a performance at the end of the course using the undergraduates from Birmingham, um, I wrote letters to people, invited them along. Um, you're very I'm, proactive yeah but you've got to be in this yeah, industry yeah. haven't you? you know that you were proactive at college you were saying that when we were at uni you yeah. got yourself a well I blagged that with a letter as well that well, was a there you go. and they wrote back and said no and I rang them up and said I've got this letter saying yes and they were like they went off the phone came back and went oh well you better come in and meet us I was like yes you see yeah you've got to you blag see, it you've done you're it. right <laughs> go so, on girl <laughs> exactly that so um so yeah, you've got a knock on doors. So anyway, we we there's a writer director called Terry Johnson, and he had done some um, sessions on the course. He came to see the play, and he said, "Have you got a copy of the script?" And I said, "Yeah." And he took it, and he took it to the artistic director of the Bush Theatre the next day. He took it to his birthday like barbecue, and said happy birthday, and gave him the play. Oh, and wow. it was that was in like the July, and then it was on in the November as part of the Bushes. 25th anniversary season so that, a little bit of luck but a lot of talent there yeah I mean that's and, fascinating and that director I I, I googled him and yeah. he directed uh One Flew Over the Cookies Nest yeah. in the West End which I went to see because I had a crush on Kristen Slater in wow. 2004 Six and that was great separation. yeah like wh- wow that that the chances that he was going to see that play and then went happy birthday to a guy at the I Bush Theatre that's fantastic. And and it, so many connections came from that. So Gemma Bodinet directed it. The administrator at the theatre at the time was a, a, a woman called Deborah Aiden. They met and then they'd never really done anything. We, you know, they'd no, not done a Liverpool play before. And then a few years later, they applied to um, run the Liverpool Everyman and Playhouse and they got the job. So and they've been there 15 years Deborah left last year Gemma's still there and yeah and they've gone on to they rebuilt the everyone and won the Sterling Prize for it the architecture prize and you're like and it's just from that little connection of me writing a play and when you think of things like that you're like wow what if I hadn't written that play what if I hadn't written that play Liverpool wouldn't have had that award-winning Sterling Prize Theatre, which maybe which was built on the area of the hospital that you were born in. Yeah, the hospital was just behind. That. But isn't that weird again? <laughs> it's really weird. It's like you're and, really affiliated with that theatre. Yeah, and because I wrote a letter there as well <laughs> when I just before I was sixteen, um, to ask if I could be in. They were advertising for ushers, but I said that I was sixteen. But I was just I was fifteen. You must write some great 16. letters. You know? guess so yeah. anyway I got yeah. a job there and so that was my first ever like paid normal job and now I'm on the board of trustees amazing you know well, if you could go back so and see that back. kid that was doing that and go know. you know what one day I know. that's fantastic yeah. I love the fact that you like think that you haven't done much and then when you actually say it out loud it's like yeah I'm pretty good we haven't even got to the fucking Emmy and shit yet I know. <laughs> Anyway, so Caravan was on at the Bush Theatre. Yeah. You then, uh, at, oh, and you won the George Devine Award yeah. for that. Yeah. Which, again, I, I looked up this geezer, the George Devine. Yeah. And he was a director, actor in the 1930s, who started the Old Vic Theatre School and was affiliated with the Royal Court Theatre. Yeah. I mean, this is very And amazing. loads of people like who's, who's famous have won that award. Yeah. Yes. And I'm like, I'm And me. so have you. I know. 
It's Amazing, so thick. Is it like, have you got it in like... No, the, you didn't get, you got like, I got a check. You didn't get, there's uh, not like an actual award. Oh, I mean, but, but you I just, think a check's like, very better. Yeah, it was <laughs> yeah. at the time. Um, um, so, God, and then he went on to write Normal. Yeah. That and was that was also on at the Bush, Bush Theatre. Theatre, yeah. So it's like that. Oh, that was, um, I tried to be all intellectual, I think, when I was doing Normal. Um, but I, I feel as though for me, it was a play that was, it almost went to the West End. And we were like one star short in a review. The producers were like, yeah, if you get five stars on Sunday, then, you know, we'll put it on. Is that how it works? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And who wrote that review? I know. Who was that person? Probably a man. Yeah. (laughs) And um, so that was like, I wanted to to look at the kind of spiral (coughs) of, um, the spiral of female um, kind of, I suppose mental health and how it's kind of passed down from generation to generation and how it's handled and it wasn't a personal play whatsoever it was you know I'd, I'd researched and read loads of books and I think at the time there were loads of stuff out there like Prozac Nation and all of that and I'm like oh I'm a playwright living in London so I'll write about this oh, yeah. um but you know it had a great cast and it did really well but it's never had another outing um, and then from there, I was mainly going into TV, and that was yeah. when I went Pleasure Land. But but normal was about like a, a woman who'd um, lost babies yes. to, in childbirth. Yeah, I mean that's quite a subject to get stuck into. Like, what was that like? How do you how do you tackle that? I, don't, I can't remember. I honestly can't remember. I read and I was reading research um, because I wanted to see how it kind of. It was almost about psychosis in a way, but, and and how it would affect people yeah but I honestly it's it feels so long ago to me now yeah um I remember being really proud of the structure of the play and it had like sort of monologues in between of of where the girl is is being interviewed um yeah and it was quite it was quite a clever play but you've you've got like because you've gone on to write for call the midwife also about babies and you've also written uh, quite a lot about um it was sort of young teenage girls yeah. that uh, are trying to explore their losing their virginity, and, yeah. and you know, I mean, I don't want to skip to, but mm. dustbin baby, yeah, she you, was you finding get, found in a dustbin, yeah. Like, there's a lot of, uh, but again, you like you say, you wrote about women, but these these aren't like happy stories, like, no. But they're also not, um, they're not like, oh my god, really, really, really sad. I mean, normal was normal was a tearjerker, but. And dustbin baby does make you cry, but there is also a lightness and a happiness to the ending of that. Um, Call the midwife, though, it always a baby that dies, and that's... Yeah, there's always there's always something sad in that, yeah. but again, it was quite redemptive. Um, and I can't... I always try and find the lightness of humour as well through, through characters, because um, we can't all be, you know, sad. But it's funny how you take it like that, and you've noticed that, what I was saying about the myth, but... Once you are established as a writer, um, and so my first play had, you know, a 15-year-old girl at the heart of it. And so therefore, when somebody's commissioning TV, they go, oh, yeah, I want to do a thing about teenage sexuality. Who can I ask to do that? Mm. They're not going to ask a hairy-ass bloke. They're going to ask me. And so it's almost like being typecast as an actor in a way. So you do get asked she can tackle that. She can tackle yeah. that, or you get sent books that are about those subjects. And while I do respond to the books, there is a certain, yeah, level of um, subject matter and theme mm-hmm. and stuff that you get asked to do. I feel a little bit shit because I haven't seen your plays. And, and like I was, was going to say that we left uni yeah. in 96. Yeah. I, I wrote that letter and blagged it on the big breakfast. I then lost my dad yeah. uh, so I kind of went AWOL yeah. anyway for that yeah. little period then ended up working uh, with Ant and Deck and yeah. TV took me over you meanwhile were like then going in another well you'd written yeah. your plays and then went into, into telly. T- telly as well yeah. after um, Caravan mm-hmm. and Normal uh, and, the, and the Morris yeah. um, you went into you've got Hetty Feather yeah so Hetty Feather's kind of the, the, my longest running project I guess we just um finished series six of that at christmas there was it's on cbbc and uh it's also available on amazon um and we're, we're big in we're big in um utah in the states because it the mormon Fantastic. tv channel bought it because it's really? kind of yeah because it's quite it's clean do you know what i mean yeah, it's victorian yeah. kids um so i was on but Hattie, again about an abandoned baby with yeah with, with, 
Uh, that, uh, they, well, yeah. they send me the book. It's yeah. Jacqueline Wilson's book. So they're like, oh, who can do Abandoned Kids? She can. <laughs> so, um, so I did that. And, and that I was on, I was developing that for two and a half years before mm. they greenlit it. Because at first they just wanted a straight adaptation of the book. And then they were like, oh, actually, we'll do all three books. And then they were like, oh, that's going to cost too much for the rights. So will you do, um, yeah, a, a, a precinct show? So I set it in an orphanage, which is true. It's and, amazing. And that that place is real. And it's just by, it's got an amazing history. It's one of those little, like, hidden treasures of London is the Foundling Museum. It's right near Great Ormond Street Hospital and Coram's Fields, and it, the history of the place is just incredible. I could talk for half an hour on the yeah. history of that place because no, it is just, it's and, really and worth a visit. See, you can see your passion, which is, you know, there's a lot of passion in there. Yeah. And more stories, hopefully. But, more stories. Um, so uh, also, uh, the one I did see is mm-hmm. Pleasureland. Yeah. Yeah, which was on in 2003. Yeah. Uh, it was Channel 4 feature-length TV yeah. drama about yeah. a group of teenagers yeah. um, in Liverpool. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't do it. Um, and they f- they feel pressure to grow up, and it's it's quite graphic. It is very graphic, um, and it was the story I wanted to come at the teenage sexuality debate um, from a kind of an average girl point of view. I didn't mm. want it to be like oh, a girl from the wrong side of the tracks. <clears throat> and while she's you know she's grown up on a council estate, I wanted to really it to be full of integrity. And I was lucky enough that I'd set it in a place that I'd lived in Liverpool. Um, called Speak, which is like quite a, it's not a rough council estate, but you know, it's not exactly, you know, financially well off. Um, and we got a director called Brian Percival, who is brilliant and has since done Downton Abbey and The Book Thief. And he was from Speak. And because like the production company were going, oh yeah, the chances of you setting it like in the shops that you want it to be set in are pretty slim. And then he come along and he's like, yeah, I'm from Speak. I'm really? going to shoot it there. And we did, and we did street casting, so we used girls who had never acted before. And so the casting director said, where can I find loads of girls? And I said, go to a Morris dancing competition. Amazing. And she, they went to this, like, so that this is like full circle, which things yeah. go like this in my life. You and really do have things go like that. And they went, and the casting director said, there was all these girls, like, sunbathing. And they were like, does anybody want to be in a film? And this girl went... Um, I've just got to show you something outside the window, Bronwyn. What? There's a rainbow in that bottom pane of glass. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, I've just got all chills. <laughs> we got to see each other again. Anyway, so... It. I'm um, so glad I re- reconnected with honestly, you. Honestly, <laughs> this is really strange. I've got chills right through my body now. So, anyway, this girl went, yeah, you, you know, uh, yeah, I'll audition. And, um, and she played the lead. And then... It was after that that the Morris was on. And, of course, she'd done Morris dance, and so she was in my play as well. Fantastic. Uh, the Times newspaper called it <laughs> uh, raw and alarming, and it, and it caused quite a lot of controversy, didn't yeah. it? Yeah, and actually what Channel 4 did was that they created a whole season around Pleasureland. So I didn't write it for this purpose, but it was kind of the centre point of a season called Adult at 14, which was about the debate of lowering the age of consent from 16 to 14. So that wasn't my intention whatsoever. I'd written, you know, a story. And um, so they put that and then there was stuff about it on like Richard and Judy and the Daily Mail went to my mum's house. Luckily she wasn't in. Um, Wow. All stuff like that. And like, you know, charities were going, this is disgusting. I'm like, well, you know what? Talk to teenagers because this is actually how it is. This is real life. Yeah. Yeah. And the amount of people that I've met, um, even yesterday at meetings who were like, oh, that really affected me because it was so real. That is exactly what happens to teenagers, that you're pressured into stuff. People don't tell you the truth. People are, like, saying that they've lost their virginity and they haven't. Um, Yeah, there's no hard and fast rules. I think kids talk about it more nowadays. I do think that they're more savvy. I'm living this at the moment with teenagers. uh, Yeah. The whole losing your virginity thing. Yeah. I I won't say more because my sons will kill me, but... Yeah, and and it's it's scary, and it's scary, like, you know, I've got a 16-year-old daughter and a 14-year-old son, and it it, it is scary, but I do think that, well, certainly for my kids, I do feel as though they were more emotionally intelligent than I was, and I think that they... Certainly, I know that my kids amongst their friends, they they are more 
far more open. Yeah, but you because you'd learned that Britain had the highest rate of teenage pregnancy yeah. at that time, so you were only writing about the reflection of the real life anyway. Absolutely. So the Times and that could yeah, stuff but actually, you know, we got we got great reviews in the Times, and it was the highest rated drama in Channel Four well, that what, year. What you did get great reviews in the Times for <laughs> you were called tremendous and uh, and a rare treat with the Telegraph uh, when when you did the adaptation of uh, Dustin Baby yeah. um, uh, and. It went on. The film went on to win an international Emmy, mm-hmm. an Emmy, baby. That's like wow. Uh, and you won the British Academy Children's Award for yeah. Best Writer. Yeah. What was that like? Oh, it was just great. We did the Emmys first. Now the team behind Dustin Baby were all women, and so um, the executive producers, women, director, producer, me, obviously. And it was brilliant working on that because when we'd have script development meetings. Literally, we would get in the room and just go, right, okay, like, you know, always somebody had to leave to do the school run yeah. at some stage. <laughs> and so we absolutely, we were all so focused. We all really worked well as a team. And we all went to New York. Right. And, um, yeah, and, and uh, you know, John and the kids came. My mum came and John's mum. We all did this, like, once in a lifetime family trip only I went to the awards but uh and obviously the, the team that I was working with what do you wear oh, I've got a story about that <laughs> you have, go on. <laughs> right so I was on the bus going into town right with my daughter it was half 10 and um I got a phone call to say I knew that we were up for the Emmy and then and I then knew I f- we were up for the Emmy and then I got I a phone love to call send that to you at uni. oh by the way you'll be up for an Emmy in a few years <laughs> And then um, somebody phoned me and went, oh, my God, you're up for a bath. And I was like, oh, my God, what can I wear? My friend who works in TV, she's a producer, director up in BBC Scotland, and uh, she'd done some Oscar coverage. And she was telling me the stories of how people borrow stuff, you know, like to... And I thought, do you know what? I'm just going to ask. And there's this, like, really posh shop in Liverpool. So I happened to wander in with my little girl and go, do you know what? I'm up for these awards. Do you, like, ever lend anything? And they were like, no, we don't. But we had this really young designer in this morning and we can connect you with her because she might like to get some of her stuff out. Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay. So they put me in touch with her and, um, yeah, and then I went to her showroom or yeah, her yeah. fashion agents or whatever in London and she lent me all these just amazing dresses from her collection and I took just loads of clothes from New oh York. Oh, my God. That, what, so what did you end up choosing? It's like, it was grey, silk, floor length, kind of almost quite a 1930s yet Grecian vibe to it. And um, me and all the production team, we all got ready in a hotel room uh, in New York and we hired uh, makeup artists and hair and oh, stuff. And it was, exciting. we just had such a laugh. That's so brilliant. I, it I mean, it, it probably ended up being Vera Wang or someone you didn't even know. Honestly, I mean. <laughs> yeah, she doesn't design now. And, and it was just, it was beautiful. Anyway, I loved oh, wow. it. The best bit of the Emmy is this, right? So we all go up to, to collect the awards. We all go up hand in hand. Only two people are allowed to speak. And then you come off stage and you go down these back stairs and you are in the kitchens of the New York Hilton, because oh. it's in the, right. And to get to the press room, you walk like through a basement corridor, through the kitchens of the New York Hilton. And there's all these like American guys going, well done, ma'am. And it was, that oh. was the best bit. You just in this like shitty corridor yeah. with an Emmy and, you've got your posh clothes on and then you go up these other stairs and then they open the door and there's this like a press room and you just... You'll and never change. The best bit for you of the Emmys was walking through a shitty corridor. You're was. amazing. Because it was just, that was really real. Yeah, and real. It was like, it's bringing it back to the real, aren't you? I love it yeah. always. That's and it was great. just such a laugh. These like sort of, you know, hairy ass blokes <laughs> pushing trolleys, like tea ladies, pushing <laughs> trolleys going like, yeah, congratulations, ma'am. Wow, that's fantastic. God, congratulations, though. That's, oh, that's phenomenal. And, and and the fact that you've just, like, gone there is... Who, who knew? Who knew? When we were at uni. And then getting the BAFTA, I remember the few little moments from that, was I remember when they were about to announce it, and whoever was announcing it, I think she was out of, like, Merlin or something, this beautiful actress. I don't think, well, maybe there was, but it's like streamed and not televised, this awards. And so, but I remember them putting the mask down on the podium and I thought, 
oh my god it's looking at me oh my god the way it was facing yeah the way the angle at which it was facing oh, it's looking at me it's looking at me does it mean I've won and then and I did win and but I remember that they play music you know as you walk up yeah and I've never ever forgotten it that it was pink and I can't remember the title of the track but it's the one that goes so what yeah, I'm a rock rock star. Star, yeah. and whenever I hear it I'm like oh yeah, my god on. this is me yeah, this is my bath to music do you know what I mean <laughs> And uh, yeah, I've never forgotten. I that. love your stories. That's fascinating. And I'm just, that was just, yeah, that was brilliant. I'd love to play that on the podcast now, but I, I probably won't be able to afford no, the rights for it. Probably not. And and then you get your BAFTA, but they don't give you a box or anything. So I had to take it home the next day. It wouldn't fit in my suitcase. So I took it home in a carrier bag <laughs> on the train. The glamour. The glamour just wrapped up is so heavy is as well. It? Where's that now? On the fireplace. Oh, oh I've got a great BAFTA story. <laughs> Do you want it? Yes. Yes. You are now. Don't go yet. We're going to like eat until the last minute. Right. Okay. Are you sure? <laughs> yes, I do. Do you want me to say it now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Is it rude? No. No, go on. But you might die laughing. <laughs> so I had my roof, a new roof put on my house a few, a few years ago and um, they needed to do something to the chimney. So the, one of the guys came in, he went, you know, you know, that on, on your fireplace, like, is it real? And I'm like, yeah. And he went could me and the lads possibly have our picture with it? And I was like, yeah, of course. So he picked it up and he's like, everybody says, oh my God, it's really heavy. So we took it out, but I didn't know where they'd had their picture taken with it or anything. And then he brought it back in and that was that. And then um, a few months later, a mate of mine, was honest to God, it wasn't me, but a friend of mine um, was on Tinder. Oh, no. And she messaged me and she went, Oh my god, you are never gonna believe this. It's got your name on it, right? Oh no. It, well, you know, it's 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 got my name on it, but there in the alleyway, because I live in a terrace house, in the alleyway at the back of my house, next to the bins with my number on, like of my house, is a man that says Kev 43, Waver Tree, with me BAFTA on Tinder. Oh my god, that's fucking brilliant. <laughs> Honestly, and you got that fact. Did they take a photo and send it? I, I've got it on my phone somewhere, right? So, Kev43, and another friend of mine went, Well, you know, it takes him from a nah to a maybe. <laughs> and honestly, so this, there is a man, a roofer, who's using my BAFTA as his Tinder profile. You've got a great way of telling a story. <laughs> <laughs> honestly and i just love that you know and you're like but everybody will know it's mine because there's not that many bafters knocking around yeah. there's a few in liverpool that's hilarious <laughs> yes, Only really me. <laughs> you've already told me some funny stories we can't even touch uh <laughs> now but but to, just quickly tell me about you because you said obviously you did the trip of a lifetime to new york yeah to, you've just gone traveling recently again, yeah i went you? to sri lanka i was asked by the british council to um to go to Sri Lanka and work with eight female filmmakers. And I went to a city right at the top of the island, which has been closed off for 30 years during the, the troubles in Sri Lanka. It was opened up nine years ago and it's called Jaffna. And it really reminded me of Liverpool for loads of reasons. And the people really reminded me of Scousers. And, um, and, I, and I went and I worked with these girls, some of whom have had a really tough time in their upbringing. Um, one of whom a gorgeous girl called Bavanida who is so talented as a director and she is a director because growing up her family was so poor that like her dad worked at a hotel but if a guest ever put newspapers or magazines or even books in the bin he would take them out of the bin and then sell them on the roadside wow so he would he was basically reselling yeah. rubbish that he found in the in the hotel bins and amongst some stuff that he brought home one day it was a dvd of the film run lola run and she watched the dvd and went right i've, I've got to be a director and 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 she is mm. and she she's tamil and she suffered a lot because of, I, I, i'm not you know i'm not au fait with the how things are in this conflict in sri lanka but she'd suffered a lot sort of as a child and um yeah and she's now been chosen to be in the Berlinale Talent Development 2020. Um, I got a film shown at Earls Court Film Festival recently, and she's just tremendous. And it was just an honour. These girls work so hard; yeah. they've got nothing at all, and yet, like some of them are doing do podcasts are and doing. Really? Yeah, yeah. Well, one of them's got like the only female sort of online chat show 
in Sri Lanka on oh. YouTube, and uh, and they're not afraid to talk about stuff like this. Yeah. And they're not, um, and and you know they do voiceovers and they do this and they do that and they run media agencies and the directors and they are just amazing. And I felt, oh, I don't know, it's just such a strange one. You know, we were seven hours on a train going up there, and we just met some wonderful people, and that felt really special. Yeah, given. Just getting to meet them inspired me, and yet I was able to give back and inspire them. Yeah. Um, getting up there doing a talk in front of them all. Yeah. yeah. It's fantastic. It was, just, it was just a beautiful trip, and one, I hope that, you know, I'll go back to Sri Lanka and do more. It's a re- it feels a really special place. Well, I hope that's brought more of you in the future that we'll get to see. That'd be Hopefully, fantastic. Yes, definitely. I loved dossing around with you in Liverpool. And now we're oh, going to yes. dust around a bit more in Absolutely London. Absolutely, we are. It's been fantastic to talk to you. It's an honour. Can I just Bron. quickly get you to say the last thing? Last thing, because your stories are so good. Yesterday, you got um, locked in J.K. Rowling's <laughs> toilet. Tell us that. Yeah, well, I had a meeting at her production company and her offices. I didn't quite realise that they were sort of her offices, and. Um, They'll well, be I, yours one day. Oh, you know, I'm going to move in. Anyway, that, so I, I just was like, oh, yeah, can I go to the loo? And, and and I went to the toilet, and it was like a key code. The guy opened the door to let me into the toilet, and I locked it from the inside, and then I unlocked it, but the key code bit wouldn't work, and so I had to call reception <laughs> and go, I'm actually locked in the <laughs> toilet. So I was, I was I put on what? Facebook, I was quite disappointed that there wasn't a wand to let me out, and I did have to, like... I was sweating. I was like, "Oh my god, I'm be late." So yeah. I got well, you've got in. another meeting now that you're going to be late yes. for. So we've got we've got to end this now. Yeah. But uh, honestly, congratulations! Thank it's you. been so bloody lovely to reconnect it's with you. It's just and really lovely to to natter and reconnect with you because it's just been too long. But it just feels like yesterday. It really does. does. That's a, that's a true friend right Isn't there. It? But we're definitely going to do this again. Absolutely. And uh, we'll take photos in front of that view yeah. and show everybody. Oh, what a lovely day. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much, Ellen. Thank you, Bronwyn. Mm. That's it for now. Love you for listening. And don't forget to show love. Thank you to Ollie Trevers and Danny Wright for their great music and Alex McArdle for the edit. A special thank you to Tim Van Summeren for lending his house for this recording. Please follow us at Show Love UK on social media and feel free to spread the love by telling your friends. Thank you. Self-stimulation, instant gratification I'm self-medicating, therapist recommending More meditating, wasted education I need more admiration And I, I don't want to bother with today I pretty much missed it anyway Might as well stay Stadium, my name carved in the pavement, and I.